All right. Well, welcome everyone. <clears throat> welcome to the Terror of City Parking. This is our October themed webinar. Glad you can make it with us. So I am Paul Callum. I am head of business and marketing here at Shiva. The general flow for today is opening remarks right now. And then I'll bring on uh, another guest to do uh, talk about smart cities and set, set some use cases and kind of set the stage for our discussion. And then we'll welcome our guest speaker and then just have a general good, good kind of discussion and debate and open it up to some Q&A. All right, with that, I'd like to welcome uh, Trevor Kerwin. He is our energy market and smart cities analyst. Trevor, if you want to turn your video on and do a quick introduction, that'd be great. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Paul. Uh, and uh, thank you again. Welcome everybody to this uh, uh, to our event here today. Uh, again, I'm Trevor Crowen, um, the energy and uh, energy analyst here at Shiva. Uh, and we we wanted to sort of uh, jump off with our, our uh, Halloween theme here today um, with our uh, uh, with our our, our post COVID uh, webinar on parking here. The, the, the we're calling uh, today's uh, uh, webinar the you know in the spirit of the Halloween, the Hall, the Halloween season uh, we call these challenges and opportunities the four horse, horsemen of the post uh, post COVID parking apocalypse. The world's <laughs> recent experience with uh, COVID nineteen lockdowns has led to parking facility managers uh, to consider entirely new plans for parking real estate. Uh, this affects both privately run parking and parking assets management at various levels of government. In trying to figure out what the new normal of parking might be, we're still waiting for what the new normal might be for cities overall right now. Uh, what will traffic look like overall? Uh, what is the impact of various forms of work from home scenarios? Uh, if the ratios uh, of real estate changes from commercial workplaces to entertainment locales to residential, what do we know? What's that mix going to look like? And how will we get to understand these new behaviors to make parking experience better for parking costs and more lucrative overall for asset owners. So our first, uh, uh, our first horseman of the parking apocalypse, uh, Paul, you go ahead. Fewer spaces available for parking. COVID has taught us that we want safety from illness, but still crave safe spaces to interact. Uh, so the real estate that was once dedicated to curbside parking uh, or multi-space or even to a multi-space parking lot uh, might have been commandeered for other uses during uh, the lockdown from outdoor dining to COVID testing. Or we're going to dive into that in a little bit more detail. Second horseman is understanding the new normal of traffic patterns post COVID. We're not yet even sure how often we'll even be to work anymore, uh, except to know that it may not, it's probably not going to look like April of 2019 or April of 2020 or even April of 2021. Uh, so we're going to take a look at that. Uh, the third horseman is transparency on fees. Uh, most cities generate revenue from parking via both fees to park and fines for when a parking statute. Uh, but that makes the vehicles that are parked, uh, the, the things that are actually in the spaces, the dumbest object in the world are connected devices. It, it effectively just takes up least space for a set time period. And if you overstay that welcome, you will get a ticket. But, but what do we know? What do we know about the car and its driver? Where is it on a particular day? Why is it there at a certain time and a certain hour? We'll look at that as well. Uh, finally, the fourth horse on the rickety horse is aging infrastructure. Uh, both private parking asset owners as well as cities are blessed or maybe cursed with various vintages of equipment, different hardware makers um, that actually manage parking assets. So every new tech that comes along whether it's the oldest coin operated systems to card readers to parking apps, where it gets rolled out across an entire fleet all at once uh, uh, to every pay point. Uh, how do we tackle this? We'll give some insight to that. So let's begin. Paul, if you give me your right. next slide. Here we go. Thanks, sir. Uh, so let's discuss the battle for parking space going right now in cities worldwide. Cities around the world from uh, from Paris to New York to Barcelona to Melbourne, Australia, we've all come on the other side of COVID shut down with different streetscapes. Citizens have seen curbside parking spaces and parking lots transformed into parklets like we have here in San Francisco, or dining or designated slow streets dedicated to bicycles and pedestrians to allow people some kind of safe interaction. For cities that were born before the COVID became ubiquitous, uh, it's kind of like feels like turning back the clock to a more genteel time um, for newer cities designed around car traffic 
the opportunity to imagine spaces may it, it might be harder, but it might actually be a greater change than what's happened in the past. Given and let's throw into that mix, uh, given newer solutions for final mile use cases like short term rentals of e-bikes and scooters, uh, there's a lot of new tech deployment being dragged forward by years. It feels like COVID kind of everything up really quickly because of this vacuum that's created by, uh, you know, the, the whole put in car traffic by COVID. So in many cities, like here in San Francisco, um, these there's a, there's a lot of pressure um, for temporary measures that are being debated to be made permanent. Here in whole, and we're kind of looking at this basket of old bylaws that we've had in a lot of places, and, and land use uh, land use cases that were set years ago and throwing all that out to make uh, cities a new place to interact with our fellow citizens in a safe manner. In cities like New York, where commercial um, real estate commands a premium price, uh, the, the new additional socially distanced space actually add greater marginal revenue by spending uh, overall seating capacity for restaurants, let's say, or, or somebody who may have had you know, a, a, a bar or a restaurant before. So have more space. Uh, but the reality is, uh, the, the eventually weather makes all this outdoor seating in a lot of the world in Europe and North America impossible year round, right? So, what do you do with that asset? In you know, when you look at the whole calendar, not just a day or a week, but a year. So, what's the best use of this estate from a decade of parking? Uh, you can make yes no decisions in some cases, but there'd be some square feet of curbside parking that might be best used for parking space in some days and some hours, a restaurant parking space at some time. So the goal of most parking operators would be how to best optimize the space over whatever time frame, uh, a day, think a day, a week, a season, a year, special events, um, you know, concerts, sports events, uh, parades, whatever it may have to be. Um, and, and what's the best, and how can we factor in holidays and best push in the real-time availability out to the client or the stakeholder base? Next slide, please. Now, uh, the next up, our next horseman, uh, is the new normal traffic patterns. What will they look like post -COVID? Since most city quarters shut down abruptly in the spring of 2020, downtowns across the world looked like ghost towns for a long time. Um, in, in certainly the case in San Francisco. Into that vacuum of carless space, we've made accommodations for temporary curbside pickup and many other uses like we've mentioned uh, with the first horseman. But local economies need that traffic back. That's the reality of it. And not just for parking revenue, but for the retailers, restaurants, everybody else in that economic ecosystem. At the same time, uh, workplaces are faced uh, with a new workforce that in varying degrees has gotten comfortable with working remotely. Uh, we made it through the storm with limited impacts on productivity in the end. Um, so broadly speaking, but that's the, obviously varies greatly from industry to industry, but broadly speaking, productivity kept up even though people weren't physically in the office. Uh, and so a lot of those employees are asking, do I need to start commuting again? And this is a real issue because across the United States, um, the US Census Bureau helps calculate the times people spend commuting. Commuters count the cost in addition to the time uh, with an average annual pay of $2,000 to $5,000 per commuter, uh, depending on where you live in the United States. So if I could save time and money and I'm still just as good at my job, why can't I continue with, I like this new setup. Um, so, and I mean, just as COVID has reordered city finances and various commercial ventures, it's also reordered people's personal finances in that sense. Uh, it's, it's, it's a new calculation. It's a new perk, if you want to think of it that way. So in short, whatever the new normal looks like, it's likely to be somewhere between January 2019 in terms of how it feels pre-pandemic and January 2021 at the height of the pandemic here in the United States. Uh, it, so whatever this hybrid will look like, uh, it'll vary greatly between types of employers, you know, certain areas like tech, consulting, accounting, people to work remote or are enabled to work remote uh, will be will probably embrace this lifestyle. Um, finance people might be more tied to desks for compliance or or data safety reasons. And obviously, you know, some some areas, healthcare, manufacturing, I've got to go to work. Uh, my tools are at work. So uh, obviously, they still need to be staffed on site. 
this could also drive um, a, 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 the real estate mix that you could see in tomorrow's downtown, how it might look different than today's. You could see more temporary workspaces. Think of WeWork or Regas or somebody like that, uh, where, where, you know, there, is there more flexible space for communal meeting um, it, it versus, you know, you having this office tower, you know, you may be sharing space. Um, you will probably see more residential conversion of disused office space. Um, somebody's going to do something with that square footage. Uh, obviously, commercial real estate people are very concerned about who's not coming back downtown and what do they do with that space as a result. And, and if that mix happens, um, you know, what, what about the rest of the, the, the street frontage? Uh, what's the retail mix look like? What's the, the, you know, what does the sidewalk level look like with that differing number of people and different, different flows going forward. Uh, all of these real estate use cases have different parking needs. Uh, we get back to our point here, you know, this is, this creates a very different parking world than we had pre-COVID. Uh, building codes require parking for residential towers. So if I convert to residential, I've got to handle the parking issue. Um, you, and you need to do that to avoid clogging what was typically curbside parking, right? Fewer curbside spaces may be needed as the worker influx is lower overall and the on top of that, think about a world where people might be, you know, marginally more people living downtown, but marginally fewer people commuting downtown. What's the next generation of last mile delivery vehicles? They need new places to alight rather than double parking everywhere. Um, so what does that look like too? And then mention one other big sort of bit of a fly in the ointment for this and something we're closer to my heart. Not to mention that in, in these concentrated areas, as vehicle technology converts to EVs, and that's not a thing that's going backwards, it's only going forwards in terms of manufacturing what new cars will look like in the next 10 years. Um, as we move from EVs to combustion engines, more EV charges needed, which means more cars need to stay somewhere for longer to fuel up. Um, how do you effectively meter all of this safe that way? So the goal, again, should be gathering and using real-time data to manage risk and reward of flexibility of use of parking resources. Uh, you know, rather than relying on the prohibition system, there's no parking here during rush hour, you know, 30 minute limits on spaces, uh, which to encourage turnover and so on. How do we incorporate real-time use cases until we see the patterns, until we see the new patterns and hone in our parking resource planning? Uh, next slide. Next up, uh, a chance do fee transparency with all users and, and stakeholders. This is a really interesting thing that when we, when we took a look at here. Um, while private parking for some time has used price choices and familiar with how many minutes a quarter might get them when they stick it into a parking meter in wherever they may be living right now. Um, overall, real-time management of these resources is actually quite low. And a lack of data on clients as well as their use patterns creates a black box of revenue, uh, which typically revolves around enforcement for a lot of it's more stick than carrot, uh, to, to put it that way. So let's face it, uh, parking is a classic grudge purchase. Uh, uh, you know, no one pulls up the city parking meter and expects to dynamite customer experience. Uh, similarly, even private parking tends towards the kind of customer services you'd expect from a place where you're willing to leave a metal and glass for a few hours. Uh, we park because we must. Uh, that's the simplest way to say that. We, we want to be in and out as easy as possible and not get a ticket. Uh, that, that's when we try park. And the reality of tickets is that they make up the bulk of revenue for city, uh, for at least city owned parking assets. The city of New York uh, collects roughly half a billion dollars a year of parking fines. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. The, the volume of tickets in the early 2000s in New York uh, was so high, it would actually, it was more economic to scan copies of handwritten tickets given out by meter maids and manually input the systems into the New York City system by sending them as PDFs to Nigeria and having somebody do the, somebody read them there and do the manual data entry. Think about that. And that was an overnight turnaround that they did with a city of 8 million people. Per the graph on the slide, um, you'll see here, it's, it, you could ignore the big dip at the end because that's just, that's where the new data is coming in. But on this on slide, you can see that it looks like San Francisco's parking meter revenue seems to be returning to normal, um, you know, roughly a little over a million dollars a week. Uh, you know, let's call it $55 million a year. But what the city especially has missed in, the, in COVID is the $78 million a year gains on ticket revenues because it's basically suspended all street cleaning, 
um, overnight parking rules and so on during the COVID lockdown. Um, and that ratio you're seeing, about two thirds tickets to one, uh, you know, the revenues being about one third fees and two third fines uh, is actually pretty common across a lot of cities in North America. Urban myths about, you know, ticket quotas when we drive around a park, like, oh, somebody really watching me or really looking for something. But, but, it, that's may or may not be real. Uh, and But everybody has a story of a ticket they feel they didn't deserve. The reality is for city parking managers, these tickets are mostly given to stakeholders in your municipality, voters, uh, citizens of your city. Why don't these, you know, there's that feeling of, don't these people know we pay their salary? Why are they giving me a ticket for this? It, that feel, it's, it's very antagonistic. Does it need to be that way? If it's a revenue issue, how do we address the revenue issue? The average citizen in a retail setting is actually quite willing to give up a lot of data for a discount, uh, a better experience of belonging to some kind of community, right? Yet cities know them only via the property tax bills or the voter registrations and outstanding liens, like if they don't pay a parking ticket. So how do we change that? Uh, what if you knew who's parking where, when, and how frequently? What if as a driver who needs to park, I was given a break you know, on a rate and return higher overall rate that would incorporate tickets and parking revenues into a single transparent number? As today's you know, civil reawakening uh, continues, uh, also, one issue about these fines is that people feel they fall disproportionately on those who might be able to least afford them, and, and thus they go into a leanest place against folks who can, who can least afford to uh, perhaps have their transportation options limited by that. If, if a city was honest about an hour of parking peak use costs versus off peak, and you could and since you would tend to park in the same areas, maybe you, you have patterns, you're parking somewhere for lunch, you're you know, going back and forth to wherever you may be doing with part of your job, could suggestions make you about when to leave, where's the space, which space is available, where it's best to look for space, and so on, wouldn't that be very beneficial? It's an overlooked area of, the, uh, of data that would benefit city planning as well as end users who park. Uh, and even other stakeholders like uh, real estate, uh, people who manage real estate dedicated parking, but also other decisions for, for business expansion, right? So the goal here is very big. not your customer, um, who right now is known only by a timer or by a bylaw officer who sees time has run out. Uh, next slide. And finally, uh, our last horseman on the ricketyest horse, um, the tending of multi-generation and aging infrastructure environment. Uh, you know, as we mentioned in the previous slide, uh, parking is a classic grudge purchase. Uh, no one wants to pay for it, really, but they do. Um, it's again, you just get in, get out, not going to take it. As such, the best they can hope uh, for quick turnaround time interaction with, with the technology they see in the field is uh, easy to use pay station. Unfortunately, for that technology, it has to stand outside in the elements year round. And you might be a bit cranky too if you had to stand outside in the cold, wet, and made it snow all the time. And so often that equipment is. Uh, city parking infrastructure suffers from having several types of uh, hardware in the field at one time, um, often different operating systems. And that's even assuming that in some cases everything has been digitally converted. Um, let's use this example of the city of Sacramento. Uh, they recently did an audit of. Uh, 4,500 uh, new, uh, new smart parking meters that they installed starting, uh, they did the survey in 2019, but that was already eight years into the lifespan of that hardware. They put it in in 2012. And what made them smart, uh, <laughs> let's turn back the clock a little bit when we talk about smart technology, is that they, they had the ability to take credit cards, they had small panels to keep a battery charged up in it so they didn't need uh, low wattage electricity or they didn't need to be connected that way. And, and they allowed you to use pay by phone apps. They also had an extra installation uh, that wasn't actually deployed, but were capable of using GPS technology, but often that was never exploited. They were just ready for that. Um, that's something that's close to our heart here at, at Shiva. What the city found when they did this audit was eye-opening. 20% of more payments had failed to actually reach the meters and resulting in lost revenue to the city and possibly a fine for a person who thought they, a car owner who thought they'd a good fit that they'd for their time. Um, but the upside, and this is the upside, maybe put quotes around that, 
70% of payments were closed uh, by the mobile carrier and payments were made within 70 seconds. Now, uh, we challenge, the, the, that means somebody had to put their card in, make their payment, wait 70 seconds for confirmation of the payment and then go on to their business that whatever they're there to park for. Now, uh, we challenge anyone to stand by a park and wait for a transaction to conclude for 70 seconds. Um, Google will tell you that people abandon videos that won't load in three seconds. Um, that is pushing the patience of the modern American 70 seconds. Of. So, the city, so the city said that they were targeting problem smart meters. And this is quite alarming too, in a sense. Um, the city said they were also targeting problem smart meters that need maintenance, not via information coming off the device, which is, is a smart device and thus connected, but by the number of citations each meter generated that were contested. Um, so in other words, waiting for that, now it seems like waiting 70 seconds for your meter uh, is an easy price to pay compared to the time you're gonna spend arguing about a ticket not being legitimate for you as the guy who got the ticket. And that metric of people contesting tickets that they felt they got did not get in earnest is how the city was using, how the city was determining, oh, that meter is broken. Uh, so, but let's set aside the various generations of parking hardware and operating systems for a moment and take an even you know, a couple of leaps forward. Like we already we decided that is, that's an issue. I mean, these smart transactions could, or these smart meters can make transactions, uh, not an issue, but the payments layer in tech right now is quite fragmented. Uh, with new FinTech players disrupting older systems that may have longer term contract with the city in question, um, what, what is cutting edge in terms of that payment technology? And let's leap forward again to today's current app culture. Um, uh, on this slide we're showing you right now, if this is just six different parking uh, logos for six different parking apps I could quickly harvest in, in a few minutes of, of looking on my phone. Um, it's just a small sampling of over 200 uh, parking apps that exist right now globally. Some are very much focused on one city or a country or a region or a parking operator or whatever it may happen to be. But, there are a lot of different, it's just, it's a wildly fragmented um, app space. And some apps, you know, they have long-term contracts with the city. So you have one app like we have here in San Francisco, pay by phone is our, is our app that we use. And so there's one app that rules all, but in some places, uh, uh, the issue then becomes who gets that contract because they have to go out and catalog each node, each parking meter, and therefore give it a unique code in their system and be able to um, read it correctly and bill it correctly. Um, now, in some cities though, um, Stockholm, Sweden, for instance, there's three competing parking apps. So each one of them has to go out and label each node so that when you pull up to a meter, there's not just one sticker with a unique identifier, but three. And you gotta figure out which app you use, which number you use. Um, what's missing here uh, in the private sector, of course, has their own apps for this optimization, but a lot of them based on just making payments making remote payments easier, but also some identifying reservations. Then there's some that layer on top of that and say, we look at these three private apps and say, here's your best place to find a parking space. You're going to X address in downtown, whatever city. Um, but what's missing here is something to close the location gap. So you know which meter you're parked in front of in real time and, and to activate it um, based on whatever interface you'd like. It could be feeding back to an app. It could be something else. So ID asset owner would have access to real-time data uh, on the health uh, operation and busyness of any particular meter as well to make to make some resource decisions. The goal again here is to tie your entire parking system together for better asset management. Well, thanks again uh, for everybody for walking us through this and thanks for helping us battle the four horses of the parking apocalypse here. Uh, now let's cut them down to size and hopefully we'll move over here and tackle some questions around how to improve this parking landscape. So Paul, I'll throw it back to you. Yeah, thank you, Trevor. I, I apologize. We we there was some audio choppiness, uh, so we will handle whatever we can in the questions if, uh, if it wasn't quite that clear. But I'm very excited now, though. I'd like to uh, bring on our guest speaker from Trina City Lab. So, Nicola, if you could undo undo your video. Hey, Paul. Hi, Trevor. Uh, welcome. Thank you very much to the Shiva team for inviting me. It's really a great honor to be here.
If you could uh, give a just a quick introduction of of, uh, of how you you're connected with Shiva and, and what your focus is, and then we'll dive into some yeah. questions. I think that'd be great. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I've been I've been lucky enough to to meet uh, with the, with the Shiva team um, last year uh, during the TechStars uh, Smart Mobility Program here in Turin. I'm currently in the headquarter of TechStars uh, Program, which is OGR Tech, as you can see from my background. And my role actually uh, is the head of the innovation team for the city of Turin. Uh, it has been mainly uh, uh, a, a very important role for the last couple of uh, years in which we have been working at the Turin City Lab uh, open uh, innovation participatory public private ecosystem run by the city of Turin and uh, with the aim of actually building an ecosystem of innovation partners able to support the city towards the vision of getting smarter, as I like to say every day, uh, a little bit more. So within this program, actually, smart mobility is at the core. So really, really interesting insights by Trevor, really interesting provocation in a way, since uh, 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 in my opinion, there are, there are a couple of factors at least to consider. First factor is that there is a trend of transformation of our uh, cities and of, of our urban centers. And this transformation really goes through mobility, how mobility is affected by goods and people mobility, change, transformation, emerging technologies, new paradigm um, brought by industry and by research. On the other hand, of course, we have been uh, hit by an exogenous factor, which, which has been COVID-19, which has been, in my opinion, accelerating quite a lot the transformation, the transition of uh, uh, um, in a way, uh, uh, end users' uh, behaviors and uh, end users' needs, uh, along with industry trying to cope uh, uh, in the best way with that needs. The city stands in between. The city, per se, is now generating innovation, but the cities uh, can be uh, more active or more passive towards innovation. In my opinion, uh, based on the experience we had in Turin, at least. Uh, the city has decided to position itself as a city lab, which basically means welcome uh, urban international experimentators to come here to validate their technology, their new model, their new paradigm, and really um, uh, have a green light on running pilot projects uh, within the urban uh, uh, experimentation field and uh, be then uh, able to uh, uh, you know, get good KPIs, get product market fit, technology market fit, and then think about scaling up and equipping themselves with all the needed resources to really scale up a project uh, internationally, ideally. So just to, just to close this, this, this introduction on my side, uh, I suppose that uh, uh, the experience I'm really, I'm really happy to share is uh, what we have done in Turin over the past uh, two or three years in particular with the city lab approach and with the smart mobility centered uh, uh, vision of the smart city. Well, thank you, Nicola. Uh, pleasure to have you, especially, I know it's getting later in the day for you in Italy, but uh, it's, it's awesome to have you on board. Um, I think I'll kick us off with just a, a, a real quick question. So Tre Trevor, maybe to you, but uh, anyone can answer. So. You were you were touching on some of this, Trevor. How how did COVID really impact parking? Is it did it did it make? I mean, I know for me personally, it made it easier when it when everyone was shut down and not getting out there. And of course, now we have all the the street side dining uh, taking up parking spaces and not going away, as you touched on. But but overall, I mean, is is has life changed for the driver? Is parking really that different from before COVID? What do you think? It, it, maybe take this first, and then and, and Nicole can can follow up after because we definitely want to hear what he has to say on this. But yeah. the uh, it's definitely a different world, and it feels like to, to sum it all up, it kind of feels like we've dragged forward, um, you know, ten years of or, or ten years of innovation that we we're thinking of doing. Um, or resource planning and so on. Uh, it feels like we're we've dragged that all forward because we have you know, the the threat and the opportunity of uh, of how we can repurpose that space. Uh, you know, Nicole, I, 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 I'd love to hear what you you think of it from a city perspective. 
Well, indeed, indeed, I suppose that uh, a part of mobility, as we said, and urban mobility in particular, is connected with the, uh, uh, the, the let's say, the parking attitudes. So we have uh, uh, emerging technologies, in my opinion, which are and will affect uh, the way mm -hmm. parking is designed within the city. So today we have automation of a number of uh, uh, different um, uh, activities, different actions that, that are related to parking. We have, uh, 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 let's say, uh, uh, data, and data can be used for prediction, can be used for decision making, can be used for real time triggering a number of uh, uh, potential enablers for making parking really smart parking. So I really think that you guys at Shiva are trying to explore this kind of domain, which is really a subset of smart mobility, in my opinion, but it's really something great and huge in terms of magnitude and potential impact to happen within our city, mm. cities and, and, really, and really city centers. Yeah, I, one, one question I actually have for you, Nicola, um, on that topic. I mean, I, I, I love that you've opened up the city as a lab to experiment with everything. But when you're looking at parking, um, you know, especially in, in many major cities, you have private owners, private parking owners, which which are a big part of the, the landscape. So if you're looking in between a city and the private, is there an, an intersection? What, what are the different needs for each of them? Well, there is a, thank you for the question, Paul, because I think it's really a question bringing bringing in a way the discussion to the core of uh, smart city vision that at least in Europe is really is really advancing fast. So public, private, open innovation, collaboration. So what we are really looking at in all aspects of the smart city, including smart mobility, including smart parking, is really being able to leverage the opportunity of public and private sector to collaborate, to be to, to, to actually switch a participatory uh, uh, behavior on both sides, just to try to, uh, in my opinion, follow the open innovation rule, economy of scope. So if we want to make the parking or, or whichever activity at smart mobility level uh, more performing, uh, more efficient, uh, having a softer impact on the environment, on the, on the environmental fingerprint, well, in all those circumstances, I think it's important that the public and the private sector get together and find, uh, mainly thanks to emerging technologies, new opportunities to improve their impact in terms of better customer service and lower environmental impact, for example. Yeah, I, I uh, appreciate that. Yeah, it's, it's a hard balance to strike, uh, and, and there's there's a lot of I'll just call it inertia to to what already exists today. It's hard to change it all. Um, one of the other things that, that Trevor touched on is, is hardware. Uh, you know, the smart meters that have been out there for seven eight years. Um, generation, generationally, when we when we look at cities, you just see that there's layer upon layer of different hardware, different infrastructure that's out there. It's, it's somewhat piecemeal, and when we talk smart cities, often we 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 don't necessarily touch on that. Um, I'll throw that out to either of you. So, so what do you think the challenges are just for for parking uh, when we're looking at it from a like a digital a digital world? Like what are the challenges of, of meshing that and and all the different generations that's out there? Well, in my opinion, you know, technology is uh, uh, is happening. First of all, technology is happening, mm -hmm. and the technology curves, the maturity curves of a number of products, smart meters are just a category in a way, are continuously. Uh, you know, following, following one after the other. And what you have really happening is a very important crossroad because you have research and the industry pushing for new technology curves, new technology offering products to be adopted by cities. And that's kind of happening exponentially, in my opinion. Mm. What is linear and not exponential is the capacity of the public sector to really understand and adopt and digest the new technology. So also for smart parking and smart mobility in general, I believe that the trade-off in between the speed that the public sector has to onboard new technologies and to do decision-making on top of new technologies um, is actually delayed from the research 
applied research, technology transfer, or industrial research, which is generating a new technology curve that the city then will be uh, receiving. So at the crossroad of this kind of phenomena, in my opinion, um, there is a need of a more technical communication, a more technical liaison between industry and solution providers, cities uh, uh, as public administration looking to become smarter. So you need some sort of catalyzer uh, there in between, because otherwise, uh, no matter the capacity of the technology, but on the other hand, if you don't have the public sector aligned, uh, synchronized, and able to really understand the value of the uh, uh, startup, of the new value proposition that you are um, trying to propose, there is a mismatch in between demand and offer. And this mismatch can generate very long timing of, uh, you know, uh, uh, or friction or market friction because there is no product market fit at the right time. So I suppose that's quite, quite also a phenomenon happening with product market fit uh, 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 in the startup domain. Anything additional, Trevor? Yeah, I, 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 those are great points. Uh, the, I mean, one thing that um, we had a great uh, program here in San Francisco over the last six years uh, uh, with uh, a couple of folks doing the innovation within the uh, within the city's ecosystem, and and, and I and have since spun out into a, a program called City Innovate, I believe. I don't know. I hope I'm name checking that right. And they've opened it up to other cities. The, the, and the biggest issue being. A lot of the cutting edge stuff is is startup. It's coming out of startups. How do I get a startup? And, and the big challenge is how do I integrate startups into a city procurement process, which can be really challenging, right? And and so ultimately, what happens? What used to happen is a big player comes in, works to work with the the startup, or buys the technology, or on their technology or does something else. And so you saw a lot of big names early in the days of like smart cities uh, who would come out and say, oh, we've got a, a solution for you. We got a solution for everything. Um, you know, maybe culminating in how Google handled the Sidewalk Labs project in Toronto um, to however you want to call how that turned out. But the, the, the that idea of how you integrate that in is something that's that is changing, um, and it's it's a fascinating thing to watch because uh, because there's a lot of stakeholders in that process. Um, there's, you know, there's union, not just government and, and citizens, but unions and uh, and workforces and marrying different <clears throat> of systems and, and procedures. So challenging, definitely challenging, and. Uh... I, I want to tie it in a little bit what, what we did with uh, Trina City Labs and just in general. Now, in, in past webinars, we've talked a lot about what we call the, uh, the vehicle location-based services. So services really centric to the vehicle or to the vehicle and driver, or passenger, however you want to pair it. Um, we've looked at and talked about that ecosystem in the past. It's very big. There are a lot of players from the car manufacturer down to uh, people that run edge computing, down to all the mobile app players that play and try to allow you to you know, pay for parking by your phone or order curbside pickup. <clears throat> it's a very rich ecosystem, but now when we look at that, um, you know, how does this, how, do, how does, how can that ecosystem kind of solve the issues? And we have the issues that have always existed. It's just hard to find parking sometimes, but then you have uh, private players, you have fleets, you have all the delivery vehicles, there's a whole mishmash going on. So how, when we step back and look at the ecosystem that we're talking about, that we're all interested in, which is all all around in vehicle and how that can be enabled, how, how does that help solve the problems? And I'll just leave it open. Yeah, I suppose if I can, if you can try to add a, add a comment here, Paul, um, it's quite, uh, I mean, if I take my experience of Turin, you know, in the last 24 <laughs> months, we have been uh, um, developing 50 experimentation projects. And I suppose that 50% of them, so about 25 experimentation projects at urban scale have been about smart mobility, different kind of use cases. So still, it's a good result because it, it has been built on top of an ecosystem of about 
70, 80 players. But at the same time, still there's quite a lot of work to do at three levels. One level that we call government to citizen, so the G2C, the government educating or putting resources to make citizens more aware of new technologies. Because you know, smart parking is used by end users. So citizens will need to know a little bit more how, for example, contactless, uh, in vehicle contactless is working to go through a certain gate to do a certain kind of operation. At the same time, what's important is government to business. So local governments, especially smart city governments, need, as Trevor said about San Francisco, they really are in need to creating a good environment and a good innovation friendly ecosystem to really allow startups from US, for example, to land here in Turin and to run an acceleration program because they think that the city has the culture, the skills, and uh, the capacity of hosting the piloting of a new technology, which then can be scaled at global, at global level. And third, there is also a government to local government level. So public sector is one of the first buyer or potential buyer of new technology. So when you talk about public procurement, it is today still difficult, at least in Italy, for startups to access public procurement because the bureaucratic layer, the administrative layer is still, you know, making the trade-off or the cost opportunity unfavorable. But in my opinion, this will need to change, which means that startups will be more and more, uh, you know, able to get engagement with local administrations, with public administration, with local government, win some tenders, deliver um, outstanding startup pro uh, products and value propositions. And at that point, we will be able to really, you know, accelerate the adoption by public sector of emerging technologies with a little bit of risk, maybe, right? So post-validation, but still in that sort of, you know, um, early stage phase. So there is, there is a need, in my opinion, of a, of a higher ex uh, risk acceptance by public buyers in order to open up really to the startup ecosystem to win tenders and improve the quality and the technology cities are using. It, 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 I, the only thing I would add to that is, that is a, uh, as a technology, um, I, I'm thinking of other analogies in terms of what you have to, what you'd be rolling out into, into an environment. Um, you know, um, if you look at uh, electricity generation, for example, um, we built a system where you had a resource, a centralized resource, a big power plant, and you pushed out availability to everybody like, hey, I've got electricity, you want electricity. And that's kind of how parking feels like as a resource. And I was like, hey, here's a spot, use it, don't use it. And, and, that's, and that's kind of where we got to in the state of the art. Overlay, again, you know, the, as Nicola just pointed out with the challenges, I mean, there, there are, yeah, let's, there are challenges with the governance and, and rolling that technology, how you work together. That's a thing to do do well as well. But this layer of the availability and so far, relatively little exploitation of the opportunity for real-time data analysis and just making it available to be processed, to be used to make some decisions. Um, it would be a great leap forward too in that. And, and then you can mesh the private and public piece of that um, to me. So, so I'm gonna take a moment just to remind people if you wanna ask questions, go ahead and do the Q and A button and add them. We already have a few in there. One that I want to hit on because uh, it's a bit of what both you, you Nicola and Trevor were talking about. That you have all these, you have different players just in one city alone. Um, but uh, Sumya <clears throat> asked, curious how COVID nineteen uh, might have evolved uh, the car user expectations uh, in the context of car parking in developing, growing cities over a spilling populous country like India. Uh, but the, what I really like about this is this next bit is, will it demand globalization or local players being prime players? And a little bit of what I'm hearing both of you say, and I'll, I'll, I'll just stir it back up a bit, is, is globalization the answer? You know, I don't think it's a one size fits all. You bring in a solution and say, say, here's how everyone has to use it. 
but at the same token, if everything is is bespoke and just developed for each city or each neighborhood, it seems like that would be a challenge. So I just want to throw that for discussion. I mean, what do you do? You see the and Nicola, perhaps you touched on this. You see the the importance of just focusing more on uh, on bringing in local. What's what's the you know something that's adaptable for each need or something that's just more uniform across the whole region. That's a that's a, um, a chicken and egg problem, I suppose. Um, it's not easy, uh, and in my opinion, uh, cannot have a single answer. Um, I think it's important that any city, any local uh, uh, geography, uh, can become a part of uh, a hub which is global, a global hub uh, for a local territory. So the local need. Uh, can be the 20% of the problem, but the 80% of the problem can be solved at global scale. So if you have a solution with product market fit in San Francisco, uh, you take the solution, the 80% is fine, the 20% needs some um, uh, uh, tailor-made uh, work, but then you can most probably adopt uh, a, a majority of the solution which has been developed already. So I think globalization is really bringing uh, a great advantage for smart cities. Um, in fact, what we've been trying to do here has been, you know, um, really be open to contamination coming from a um, innovators from all over the world passing by terrain and decided to develop a specific project within the city uh, and be really trying to go around the world as much as possible to get influences, to share best practices, and to really um, you know, build connections in between uh, a network of hotspots for innovation. So to the cities, if, if it's true that cities will host 70% of the population by 2030, because they are able to create better living conditions, if that assumption is true, as UN is suggesting us, well, uh, at that point, I think cities will need to really uh, do two things. One thing is open innovation between cities. So cities from different countries, I think we had uh, among the audience an Indian uh, representative. So India, a city from India could, you know, uh, develop an open innovation program with the city in Italy and with the city in South America, for example, to really try to find a, the common part of a solution, imagine smart parking, and then tailor-made, you know, the last bit, the last mile of the solution. But on the other hand, I really believe that uh, cities will be more and more uh, influenced by how companies, how private companies are managed. Because there is a layer of complexity. Imagine a city like Turin, we have 10,000 employees, so it's a sort of a corporate kind of environment. And the same managerial rules uh, you know, can be applied to a city. Today, it is not the case because there is such a level of bureaucracy still to be removed, to be adopted, to be transformed. But I, in my opinion, the transition from now over the next 10 years will be cities adopting a public, a, a private company paradigm rather than a, a local government uh, way of managing. I, I actually, your, your, your question answered another question that came up on Q&A from the same <clears throat> individual, basically, uh, and will it prove efficient enough to have governmental programs or, or will it be better if private players go, go faster? Uh, so I think you, you really touched on that. And we're, we're hitting a bit of the end of our time. Uh, I, just, I just wanted to recap something and, and throw it out to everyone. Um, so Trevor, you hit on this in your slides. You, you, to, to approach this, you need basically you have a goal of whatever whatever you come up with as far as you know smart parking, you have to have something that's flexible. It has to be able to mesh with older systems. It has to be able to work with uh, the myriad of apps that are out there. You know, if you're going to have a success, successful, you don't really want to have a driver uh, need to learn yet another new app or another new process in the car to go through. You have to actually take points of friction out of their world to have higher engagement, have them do it. Uh, the other thing that would benefit everybody, every player, and you touched on this is the second point in your slides, was real-time data. The closer you can get to real-time data over, over all the vehicles in the area, the, the more the more leading in a third point, the more you know your customers, so to speak. You understand 
um, what, how those, those parking spaces are being used, who the people are. Uh, something at Shiva that we focus on, uh, and, and Nicola, you, you, you know, we're very aware of that. We focus very much on the driver, as you said earlier, the user. Uh, the person that's, that's using that parking space is making use of it, not just the companies involved. Uh, and that, that meshes though, there's, there's this public-private balance, as you were saying, Nicola, um, you know, you need, if you look at your parking, everything as an asset, and if you look at revenue sources, uh, you need to kind of bring them all together. You need to have a way that will, will allow everyone, everyone that's involved now in a fragmented space to be comfortable working in a less fragmented space and feel that they're still adding value. Um, so I'm just throwing it out there when we're looking again at, at this public and private effort and who's looking at smart city, uh, you know, what, what do you see as one of the more critical points, points to hit? Is it really focusing on what the city needs? Or is it focusing on what the driver needs? Or is it, is it really, and this is my own personal belief, a, a bit of both. So I'll throw that out there. It, Trevor, I would, yeah. sorry, uh, I, I would, it, you know, the part about, yeah, it, the focus on, I, focusing on the end user, the end client, the driver, um, will let you have the focus on improving your systems as well. I, I mean, the, 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 the Sacramento uh, example that I was talking about on the slides is kind of, you know, it's one of those things where you look at it and you go like, oh, you kind of slap your forehead a bit and go, wow, okay, yeah, that's right. Like that, it, it, it's, it's <clears throat> not at all any kind of knock on the city uh, for the good, thank goodness they did the audit. Um, the, just to say like, Oh, we use these assets, they're smart. Um, there is the, uh, what we got with the packaging. Um, and yeah, by and large, they operate that way, but it's the, um, the grit in between the, the real-time operation and you know, the reality operation, let's not use real-time, the reality operation and what was what, what we hoped for that is really causing an outside amount of problems and so and what what's that mean we'll take that focus down to like who's hmm. the guy standing in front of the meter for 70 seconds so that's that's how you how you enable and bring those together in a seamless fashion is to me is where all the focus should be and yeah. a lot of the rest of it comes together yeah i mean in my world and a lot of what we focus on this is a little self-serving but what we focus on is is i i would love and this was the genesis of how shiva came around um this desire to like, can we just drive up, get in a parking space, walk away, come back, drive. And that's, that's to me the ideal scenario. You've removed that grudge purchase out of my, my kind of conscious activity. I'm just pulling up, using it and pulling away. Right. Uh, when, you're, when you're talking about a system that really serves vehicles and, and where they are and combines all that together, that's, that's the ideal. Um, I know in our personal discussions, when, we, when we've worked with uh, fueling as an example, if you do a similar, you pull up, fuel, drive away and you just get charged for what you used. Uh, you're removing maybe 20 seconds from the driver's uh, you know, time of that pump. But boy, when you have to use that 20 seconds again as a driver, you really notice it. The same, same thing with parking. If you're pulling up and having to run to a pay station or wait 70 seconds for something to clear, you really notice it. Um, and once that goes away, you may not thinking, boy, I'm going to tell my friends about this at lunch. But when it comes back, you really notice it. The idea is to remove friction, make life easier for the driver. Uh, but do it in a way that really handles, uh, you know, handles both the, the city's needs, the private needs, uh, even even like the delivery Amazons of the world, that what, what their needs are and how all that balances together. Anyway, um, and Nicola, we're, we're wrapping up. I don't know if you want to add any last thoughts and then I'll ask Trevor. I think, I think, yeah, I think, I think indeed it's going to become um, a multivariable uh, uh, problem to solve. So multi-touch point, multi-platform. So that's the sort of approach we are having with digital. And that's, in my opinion, the sort of approach end users, especially for from younger generations, will have with smart mobility and its different segments, including smart parking. So we are, there is an exciting time ahead because everything is to be rebuilt, and that's the good news. Um, so I think that from uh, uh, the, all, all the, lay, the levels of stakeholders, so smart cities, industry, research, and users, um, uh, the exciting time is that we will really um, have a lot of opportunity to experiment. 
So if we connect smart cities with city lab approaches, so experimentation approaches, cities can become the test ground for such innovation to get faster to the end user and end consumer, therefore the citizens. Yeah, very good. Uh, Trevor, we're up on time, but if you have a, a parting thought, let's, let's squeeze it in and then I'll thank everyone for being here today. Uh, thank you. I, I, I wouldn't have anything to add on top of what Nibley okay. said there. It's just <clears throat> really is that, you know, the right sandboxes right now uh, are going to do a lot of things to change. Yeah, I think the, the one thing I would add to what you were saying, Nicola, uh, in, in the term of labs uh, combines a little bit of what Trevor touched on with infrastructure. One thing we really need to be aware of is, is not not just how, how survivable infrastructure is, but but really the cost of it. And if we have solutions around that we really don't need, if you can use what's out there today without, without having to deploy a sensor at every parking spot, um, that's also ideal. So I guess in that sense, if a solution comes through that's not only removing friction for the driver, but friction points for the city and for the companies operating and enforcing it, I think that would work well. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, thank you everyone. I really appreciate uh, you joining us today. Thank you for this uh, great opportunity and really, really hope to uh, be back soon working uh, in touring with Shiva to new, to new exciting projects. Uh, likewise. All right, everyone, thank you again. Uh, for those attending, we'll, we'll send out links to the recording within a couple of days, probably sooner than that. All right, well, thank you. Enjoy the rest All of your right. day and we'll see you next time. Thank you very thank much. You thank you. Take care. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.